Oh, thank you so much. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, sorry that it's, it's remotely, um, but I get to spend time with my mother, uh, which is nice. Um, so I was recently um, listening to Jane Fonda uh, speak, and she was talking about her view of life, which is that it's in three acts. The first act is until you're 30. The second act is to, until you're 60. And then uh, as, as you turn 60, you're beginning your final act. And I am rapidly approaching my final act. Um, and so I want to put... Uh, I want to put the emphasis on that as I think about what I'm doing and, and want to share what I'm doing. And it's the liberty that comes from the final act. I've heard various people say it in various ways. Um, if I can paraphrase with just a little bit of crassness, it's when you no longer give a shit. <laughs> you're just going to do what you're meant to do and you're not going to be pleasing others. And so I am so grateful that my my foray into my final act actually began over the pandemic. And it began over the pandemic when I was trapped in my house, like, like many of us were, and I was really missing teaching. And so I spent a lot of time on an audio only platform called Clubhouse. Um, and in fact, there's people in this room who I only know by the sound of their voice, I wouldn't recognize them. Um, and where we would have case discussions every week and hold office hours. And what that struck, what struck me with that is that I felt a deep sense of an obligation to democratize education, at least to democratize everything I knew. And my third act is all about democratizing and, and making broader, broadly accessible uh, what I know. So what do I know? Um, and I think as you alluded to, I started, I'm in the technology and operations management. It's operations management and then often operations of technology, which means I like to solve problems. I like to fix things. I like to optimize things. In fact, early on when we met in 2004, I was merrily optimizing things and I could optimize anything except for the pesky people. And I got confronted with the people um, and then that made optimization a lot more difficult. But I got, I then realized that people are led and that this would be, uh, and this just added dimensions and dimensions of it. And so that's the work and, and the, the work I've done with Anne Morris, my wife, and we do all of our work together. Um, our most recent book is called Unleashed, The Unapologetic Leader's Guide to Empowering Everyone Around You. And this is sort of the contagion of what we know and how we can unleash others. Um, but one of the things, if I take what we're working on now, um, I'll, I'll tell you the idea and how we're, and uh, I'm not sure we're as creative as Andre, but that was, but um, wow, if he's taking investors and his investments, I would, I'm in. Um, but to figure out how to have more spread of the ideas to all corners of the world. So one of the things, the idea, one idea that we have and that we're really obsessed with right now is that uh, problems, even the biggest problems can be fixed fast. Indeed, meaningful change only happens quickly. And that the more reasons we have to slow things down, the more difficult change is going to be and the less distance we're going to get. Now, this is a very counterintuitive idea. Um, most people will have an echo in their mind of, if I move fast, I'm going to break things. In fact, Mark Zuckerberg made that very famous by saying it aloud. Um, and what we find is that when we, when we get sad about moving fast and fixing things, we think the antidote is to slow down, and that's not right. Speed is not what's breaking things. And if we learn how to fix things, how to move fast and fix things, we can actually go further um, and more quickly and accomplish much more. Indeed, in our research, we have never met anyone who has said to us, after they have done incredible change, I wish I had done less or I wish I had taken longer. And yet, Every time we see people going about change, we, they are offered these shiny objects of off ramps to try to slow us down. So my final act, I'm trying to move super fast and fix things, but I want to do it in a way where I'm educating others how to do it. 
And so I'll give you an idea of how I'm doing that. And, and perhaps you can, you can tell me how to improve these ideas. Uh, and I'd love to have a conversation. So the first one is that Anne and I have started a podcast. It's, uh, it's called Fixable with Anne and Francis. And people call in with a problem. We've never talked to them before. If you're uh, native to Boston, you might have you might have in your memory click and clack the car talk brothers, where people would call in and uh, about any car problem. And that's how that's what we're doing. We don't talk to the people ahead of time. We get them live, and we're doing the car talk for business and for leadership. Um, and the reason we're doing this is because we could just tell people what the takeaways were. But when they get to watch and really relate to the person who starts with, I have no idea how to solve this problem, it's intractable. And in 30 minutes, it's solved. And going on that art, that's going to do, it's the showing, not telling. Because I could tell people all, you know, again and again, meaningful change happens quickly, but it's the showing part that we're trying to give access to. So that's one way uh, that we're doing it. In fact, Anne last night, in Vancouver gave a TED talk on this uh, topic, which is why she's not here with us today, um, which is another way because the podcast and the TED talk are free and they're they're again trying to inspire others to do things. We have a book coming out this fall, which is called Move Fast and Fix Things. You can see the portfolio things. The book costs money. That makes me sad. So we're making companion pieces to the book uh, that are free. Um, and then I'll tell you the thing that scares me the most, but the next place we're going is to TV, to broadcast TV, because that's the ultimate way to show people everything else has just minuscule reach compared to that. Now, I don't know if we're going to be on camera or off. I don't know if it's going to be reality or scripted, but we are going to do that as a way, again, to democratize access to, uh, to education. So I would say to the folks in this room and to the speakers before this, as academics, we want to go on to the next thing. And I do as well. I am variety seeking in the same way. But sometimes that might be at the expense of taking our message and making sure it reaches the nooks and crannies of the world and making sure that we seep it into the souls, uh, into the souls of people. So my unleashed Liber liberated third act is to democratize access to everything I know. Um, and I'm, and I'm doing that with my magnificent wife, um, Anne. So I'll, I'll pause there for some questions. Thank you. Um, thanks Francis. Um, it's interesting. It's, you're doing two, uh, I had kind of an interesting thought while you were talking about democratizing education, but you're also framing that you're providing kind of a meta way to think about problem solving. That's your educational tool. Yes. So in some ways, um, could you speak a little bit more of that? Because both you're trying to think about how do we get out to more and more people, but there's a there's a meta process that you're showing. But anyway, any comments that you yeah. feel about Yeah, and that? I think oh, that's that, fair. so if I was just going to comment on that, it's it what has struck us is the show don't tell. And it's not show I've already told is really what it is. And we're telling, we're telling in the books, we're telling that. And, you know, I, we get a, a reach that some people might be satisfied with. I'm not, um, I think we can add zeros to the people who need to hear this. I mean, if I look at the world's problems today, we do not have nearly enough leaders addressing them. We do not have nearly enough people and we have to bring people off the leadership bench. And I'm not sure they're reading a book is simply going to do it. And so we're trying every other sense that they might have um, to try to to try to get them there. So we're very much using the show don't tell as the meta part for it. And then, of course, the the issue we're starting with is that um, the world just takes the world will take any excuse to slow down and any excuse to compromise. And it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm getting old. I don't have like the clock is ticking. I don't have time to wait the world. We want the world to be set for our children. Uh, so I want to encourage the world to stop compromising, to move faster and to understand that the human beings that are asking us to go slow, the protectors of institutions, I want to thank them for their service, but I don't want them to influence our life's trajectory. 
So that's um, a meta process, but making it more accessible because as a society, we have to move faster. Uh, I so, mean, yeah. yes, <laughs> blistering. And, so here, and here's a good question from, from the internet, at least as far as we know it. So I applaud move fast and fix things, but what about blind spots? When we move yeah. too fast, we often fail to see the full picture. Yeah, that's a beautiful point. And, um, and so we, the book that we're writing and the way we do it is it's a five-step process. We think big problems take about a week to solve, like really big problems, but you have to be all in for them. Day three is titled Make New Friends. And that is um, find people with completely different life experiences with you who they'll be able to see our blind spots. They'll be able to take our pretty good plan and make it a much better plan. So you're absolutely right. Blind spots will occur, which is why we have to be um, super difference seeking and inclusive of people with wildly different life experiences to um, get in, you know, to get the perspective of them as, as much as possible. And then, you know, we're not going to get it right. But then we go back to Amy Edmondson's talk, which is, this is going to be the good kind of failure and we're going to pivot and, and implement it. Uh, so we're also not going to bring perfectionism with us. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm also hearing that Francis, the question of, of, you didn't use the word, but you said, if this is a fair expression, there's a collaborative effort here that means we can check each other's blind spots to some degree. So this question of sometimes we think about, you know, an individual point of view all around a problem, but this is probably what you're seeing is how do we also make this a collective or a collaborative yeah. activity more so in organizations? Any thoughts there? Yeah. So, and, and I get this personally from working with Anne, um, in our case, one plus one is 10, like the collaboration adds a zero. And I find that the right type of collaboration um, can add zeros. And, and so this is, you know, I'm not sure that as a solo sport, we're gonna be able to reach all of the nooks and crannies that we're supposed to reach. And so it's Anne and I collaborating, but now we're also collaborating with the TED Audio Collective for the podcast and with a television studio for the, for the TV. We're, we're getting people that we can partner with so that we can broadcast as much as possible, not just so that people um, hear the, the conclusions, but that they get to observe the process so that they have a better chance of doing it. <laughs>